afternoon uh, and welcome to the first Women's Studies and Religion program lecture for this year. We have a wonderful group of scholars this year. They're all here and we're thrilled to have them and um, thrilled to have you here for the lecture. Um, I'm going to pass around a mailing list. If you got an email inviting you to this lecture, then you don't need to uh, sign up. But if you didn't, please, um, and would like to know of future lectures in our program, please feel free to give us your email. I'll pass that around. The next lecture in our series will be on October 31st. You can come in costume. Um, <laughs> for Translating Christ in the Middle Ages, Visionary Translation, Divine Rhetoric, and Verbal Devotion in England, France, and the Low Countries, which will be delivered by Barbara Zimbalist. Um, again, will be here in the Braun Room at one o'clock. I don't know that there will be Chinese food, but there will be. No, there will not. No, there will not. <laughs> Tracy always tries to. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, I don't know what that will be. Not Chinese. Maybe we'll have uh, ale and something. Um, Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so if everybody has lunch, I think I will um, introduce today's speaker. We're thrilled to have Anna Sun here to speak to us about her work on uh, ritual gender and the afterlife in contemporary urban China. Um, Anna is the chair of the Department of Sociology and Associate Professor of Sociology and Asian Studies at Kenyon College. Um, she, is, uh, she did her doctorate at Princeton and is well known for her first book on uh, Confucianism becoming a world religion. Um, she's working on her second project here and we, I personally feel I'm at sea when it comes to understanding religion in contemporary China, and I can't imagine a better person to help me sort out these really critical uh, arenas of knowledge than Anna. She was one of the first uh, Western trained uh, researchers on the ground in uh, doing field work, of which she's done 10 years of ethnography in uh, contemporary China, urban China, and um, there's lots of other things I could tell you about her qualification, but suffice it to say, she's the one you want to hear on this topic. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, and for the very generous introduction, and also for being the person giving us such welcome in Carriage House. Uh, we have a great group of um, WSRP fellows this year. My fellow fellows, thank you for being here. Um, and thank you for your support. And I want to thank especially Anne, Catherine, who will be with us next semester, and Dean Hampton, and Dia Giasco for your support. Um, and also I want to say that many of you here have been my inspiration, especially in the study of women and religion. You're the pioneers in the field. Um, I see Anne, I see Catherine, I see Karen, I see Janet. Um, and. Um, I, I um, so look forward to learning from you this year. I have been studying religion in China really since 2000, when I was still in graduate school. I have been conducting field work on prayer life in China for at least the past 10 years and very intensively in the past five. So what I'm sharing here with you is first an overview of what I see as a landscape of Chinese religion today. And then I will um, focus on both theoretical and methodolog methodological issues necessary for us to consider in order to make sense of Chinese religious and ritual life. And my entry point is women in ritual life in contemporary urban China. Since I'm giving my talk in October of this academic year, I confess that I'm still in the beginning of my study, of my analysis of women's um, um, gendered practice um, 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 through my field work. So I will certainly have more to share with you by the end of this year, but now I can tell you what I'm looking at, what questions I'm asking, 
and I what I think of as fruitful directions for inquiry. So here is a roadmap. roadmap. I will start with methods and data, and then will quickly offer a landscape of contemporary Chinese religious life. I will then speak of the theoretical interventions we need to carry out in order to even ask the question how to turn ghosts into ancestors. And then I will focus on women and Confucian ancestral rights um, and look at the transformation of gendered rituals and gendered afterlife. I will end with perhaps um, a new way of thinking of gender, ritual, and afterlife. I hope not just in contemporary China, but globally and comparatively. So the, the title from Ghost to Ancestors actually comes from um, a Freudian psychoanalyst saying, the task of a healthy life is to, to turn ghosts into ancestors, resentments into regrets. Um, he's quite, uh, he's very influential amongst practicing psychoanalysts. And I recently saw a blog that's, that's called Ghosts, um, Ancestors, and LeBron James, psychoanalysis of basketball. So, <laughs> so, so this can be taken to many directions. But I'm using this rather in the literary, literal sense, which is ghosts become ancestors through rituals. And how do we make sense of this process? Do we dismiss it as magic, as irrational, as superstition? Or do we try to make sense of it and understand it especially in the contemporary context, instead of naming it primitive or premodern um, or worse. So I um, have been reading a lot about Greek and Roman religion in recent years. So Alpeno in Homer's Odyssey um, is someone who, who dies accidentally um, because of drunkenness and is not properly buried, so he's seeking a proper barrier from Odysseus as, as a shade from the underworld. So a ghost does not become an ancestor without ritual. Mm -hmm. Another example would be uh, Polynurus in Virgil's Aeneid, another accidental death, someone who is not given um, a proper ritual barrier, burial and who um, requests it in order, again, not to become a wandering ghost. And we have stories of death and afterlife throughout um, global mythology. And here we have Hades and Persephone, and we have, of course, many other versions from different cultures. But I am here to speak of China. My work is based on both survey work on religion in China and ethnographic fieldwork and interviews in urban China. So the service of religion um, are collaborative works with colleagues, um, uh, and also you need actually a lot of funding to do um, major surveys. So the first one I was involved in was called the Spiritual Life of Chinese Residents Survey, a survey of 7,000 people in 56 different sites in China. This was funded by the Templeton Foundation. My colleagues in the project were Rodney Stark, Feng Gang Yang, um, Byron Jensen, and others. The second survey project I was involved in was um, in 2016, the Meaning of Good Life and Happiness Survey. This surveyed 2,500 people in China, also funded by the Temple Foundation. And my collaborators in that project are Becky Xu, uh, Richard Madsen, and um, Deborah Davis. My fieldwork have been done entirely by myself, and they have two main focuses. The first one is the Confucian Revival in Mainland China project. It, I conducted ethnographic work in 15 Confucius temples in Mainland China and three in Taiwan. And for the Social Life of S S Prayer project, I conducted over 120 interviews. I still haven't processed them all. And these are participant observations and interviews on prayer life conducted in Shanghai, Beijing, Hong Kong, and 12 other cities as supplementary sites in urban China. Mostly in urban China, because sometimes an ancestral rights would take the family into rural China. The connection between rural and urban is very fluid these days. 
The interviews and observations took place in dozens of sacred sites of different religious traditions, from Taoist, Buddhist, to Confucian, from Catholic Protestant, from mosque to other shrines, as well as at grave sites and private homes. So I'm really grateful for this fellowship this year because it does take a tremendous amount of time and energy to properly analyze this data I've collected. And this year I had the chance to do so. So just give you a quick snapshot of one of my major main sites, Shanghai, it's a metropolis with 24 million people, um, size of a small country. Um, it is um, not just a, a metropolis, really megatropolis. Um, and it has um, a kind of religious, what I call religious ecology, that is polytheistic, or more accurately mixed, polymonotheistic. So it has many different sacred sites, hundreds of sacred sites, diverse um, 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 religious institutions and less direct conflict between them, more foreign and international, transnational influences, and diffused multiple geographic and social centers of religion. So just to give you, I'm sorry, this is frozen, it seems. Ah, here. So this is Shanghai um, on the coast um, in the south. And this is, um, this is sort of the most urban area of Shanghai. Shanghai is, really encompasses both urban and suburban areas. And this are the, the circles are the sites of my fieldwork. And I have conducted over 70 interviews in 16 religious sites in Shanghai, um, really crossing different religious traditions. The reason I do this is that as a scholar, we often say I'm a scholar of Confucianism, I'm a scholar of Buddhism, etc. But when you go into the field, when you talk to ordinary people who have a vibrant, lived religious life, they don't say very often, I am a Confucian, or I'm a Taoist, in fact, they almost never acknowledge themselves as much because they would um, conduct rituals in different religious sites across religious traditions. So if we take our categories into our fieldwork, we are limiting ourselves to eternal vision. And I came to this realization after my work on Confucianism. I realized people who do Confucian rituals are often who are people who are Buddhists, um, who do Taoist practices, who may even be Christians. So I decided to um, think about my fieldwork from the ground up, following people um, who go to sacred sites and conduct rituals, and then construct and understand their identity from their practice, not the other way around. But before I describe the outline of my framework, I'd like to say a few words on what it is not about. It is not about the institutional aspects of religious life. So the Fosse are not the temples or churches or mosques per se, even though they're important actors in the religious landscape. It is not about religious organizations, nor religious professionals. There are both formal and informal religious, religious organizations in China, as well as different forms of religious professionals. And they, of course, play vital roles in the revival of religious life. But this is not their story. It is not about the politics of religion, even though religious life is always interconnected with political life, and especially in China. It is very important to take into account the role of the religious policies of the state, for they greatly affect the development of, of religious institutions, organizations, and um, everyday practice. My focus is how people live their lives with religious and ritual experiences as a vital part. It is not, however, an individualistic account of religious life. I am not a methodological individualist. I understand individual religious action as profoundly, deeply social. <coughs> but this is an account and analysis of lived religion as experienced by individuals, especially in urban China. So this, so based on my field work, I have in fact two book projects that I am working on. This is a manuscript near completion called The Social Life of Prayer. I gave a talk um, at HDS a while, um, not long ago and this was what I shared. 
So as you can see, the chapter one is called Beyond Monotheistic Assumptions. We have to cultivate a polytheistic imagination to understand religious life in contemporary China. I focus on sacred rites, prayer, social action, sacred logic, a new theory of ritual rationality, sacred time, the Chinese lived calendar of ritual life, sacred self, the puzzle of religious identity, and sacred sites, the linked ecology of sacred space. So this is a manuscript near completion. And my next manuscript, which is, I think, less um, theoretical, more empirical, more narrative, is far from completion. <laughs> and it is called Women in Prayer, Prayer, Gender, and the Afterlife in Contemporary Urban China. So I want to emphasize gender and prayer as useful categories in ritual analysis. And I will provide both a historical and contemporary view of gendered prayer and looking at um, how gendered rituals and gendered afterlife um, are transcended in lived religious experience. And I will end with a discussion of gender and the creativity of prayers. I'm going to quickly go through the landscape of contemporary Chinese ritual life for the ones who are, you know, who are um, new to the subject. Um, this is a typical social science survey, the word value survey, um, that would draw the conclusion that Chinese are not religious, do belong to a religious denomination, most the Chinese do not. Um, if we want to ask uh, further, independent of whether you go to church or not, that is very promising. Would you say you are a religious person, not a religious person, a convinced atheist, or, not, or do not know? We only have you know, less than 14% who say they're religious. And if we try one more time, how often do you attend religious services? Doesn't get much better, especially if you say only on special holidays, Christmas, Easter, etc. We have 89.7% of people who say never, practically never. Um, the word service value questions sort of are easy to, to, um, um, to um, critique. And there are other surveys that try to ask a bit more sophisticated questions, but the framework itself is so deeply uh, monotheistic that it actually does not work, no matter how hard you try. So in this study survey, I participated in 20, 2007 called the Spiritual Life Survey of Chinese Residents. We ask a similar um, question, um, just for comparative purposes, to compare with other surveys. Whether you go to t churches or temples, do you believe in any of the whole following, or do you, do you, are you a member of the following? Both are asked. Um, I don't believe in anything is the dominant answer. About 78% say they don't believe in anything. And for those of you who are interested in Buddhism, 16.7% say they are Buddhists. That number is pretty accurate. I would say 16 to 20% is a pretty standard uh, number for Buddhism in China. Taoism is very low, 0.3%, and Confucianism, 0.2%. And the reason is that people in general don't claim they're Taoists unless they're Taoist professionals. Um, so such questions actually don't work in China. So if you look at the Pew um, um, analysis, um, an excellent source on religion, um, but it has many challenges, it's facing many challenges, and I've been working with Pew to actually work correct such, um, such um, um, problematic um, frameworks. Most Chinese people are unaffiliated and slash religious nouns slash not religious. So, um, so then China becomes the world's least religious country. This is from Gallup. I'm going to very quickly show you some pictures um, of Chinese um, religious life. These are Confucius temples in Shanghai with people doing prayers, both in person and online. Um, this is a polytheistic nature of altars. There's a god of fortune with offerings in the Confucius temple, with Confucius looking, Confucius um, 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 a portrait um, right next to it. This is um, the Protestant church, which is very, very successful in China. And this is a registered church. Um, and um, this is a Taoist temple with um, lots of um, ritual offerings, including these rituals for the fetus of an unborn child. 
So this is for prayers for an unborn child. And this is a woman who has lost her fetus. And I did not get a chance to interview her. But it's a very elaborate ceremony. City God Temple, which is supposed to be a Taoist temple, exceedingly popular. A women's mosque in downtown Shanghai, another vibrant uh, community religious center. Catholic Church um, is, um, is, has been growing in China as well. And this is a, a, a pilgrimage site outside of Shanghai um, with uh, women uh, often taking leading roles. That's um, a nun actually leading, um, leading him. A Buddhist temple, um, a, uh, uh, this is a Buddhist temple uh, death anniversary ritual. And Buddhist temple with young people um, offering prayers on certain um, auspicious days of the year. And this woman is a woman who is a so-called card-carrying um, um, a Buddhist. They are in the, great, in the greatest minority amongst Buddhists in China. So if you only count people who have officially converted, you get a very small, of, um, you have a very small percentage of people who are um, Buddhists in that sense. Most Buddhists are people like this people I've met. Um, I call them the sisterhood of traveling prayers. Um, they are a group of women who travel together to visit great temples to chant Buddhist sutra. And I actually encountered them in a Taoist temple in Shanghai. And there was, and I could hear they were chanting um, um, a Buddhist sutra. So I asked them, so why are you chanting Buddhist sutra? And they said, well, we're Buddhists and we study those sutras. I said, but this is a Taoist temple. They said, oh, it doesn't matter. It's a great temple. And as long as it's a great temple, um, um, that's, that's where, that, that's a sacred place. And that is not an uncommon attitude amongst many practitioners. Ancestral rights, um, these are from news sources, very formal ancestral rights. This is the burning of um, spirit money for the spirits of deceased ancestors on winter solstice. Um, this is in downtown Shanghai at street corners. And you see this um, everywhere in Beijing and Shanghai if you know where to look on certain dates of the year. And that's grave offerings on Qingming Festival. So if you look at the Chinese ritual calendar, it's not written down anywhere per se, but there are major dates for ancestral rights. There are at least four major dates for ancestral rights. So if you ask the right questions about Chinese religious practice, um, if we ask, did you conduct ancestral rights during the states in the past year, we get an astonishing percentage of, the Chinese, of Chinese people who do this regularly. And there's not a great difference between urban and rural residents or rural, urban, and migrants. Some difference, not too great. So turning goes into ancestors. How do we understand this if we don't want to dismiss it as mere um, pre-modern, primitive superstition? How do we make sense of it? I'm actually going to skip this part about the current debates and challenges in the study of religion um, and look at Ah, to look at the, the methodological debate about the foundation of our understanding of religion, belief or practice, text or action, sincerity or ritual. This is in some ways a natural development after the post-colonial challenge to the belief-centered, Protestant-centric mm -hmm. understanding of both the nature and development of religion. So Peter Berger's protest, protestization is a related concept. There has always already been a practice turn in the sociology of religion, as well as in larger field of religious studies, such as the lived uh, religion approach. So I think changes are already underway to meet those challenges. So here are a couple of things I want to say in order for us to understand rituals such as ancestral rights that are so widespread in China, we cannot afford to dismiss it or not try to make sense of it. So I argue that we need a new concept of religious plurality and religious identity. The notion of syncretism is problematic because I think it still assumes an essentialist norm of religion. 
Syncretism is what supposedly happens when separate religions are mixed together like the mixing of water and wine, two separate substances now syncretized. <coughs> we need to think of re individual religious act actors as people living their lives within the complex religious ecologies of any given society, which would have different configurations of belief systems, ethical codes, and ritual habitus. The individual religious actors may be well-versed in one or more religious traditions, and that they don't necessarily make distinctions between them as long as these traditions make good sense in the taken for granted world of everyday life. So in other words, people who do ancestral rites do other rituals as well. Um, and, and Buddhists and, 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 um, uh, and, um, may do ancestral rites in either the Confucian or Buddhist mode, um, and people who do ancestral rites often do conduct rituals in um, Buddhist and Taoist temples as well. In this sense, a religious identity in China is often a composite one, not either or. Especially, I think this is especially true in non-monotheistic societies, um, not having either or religious identity but and and. Different societies are more likely to have different modes of composite religious identities or we can call it clustered identities. And there are always going to be great variations among individuals in any given society. For instance, we already see Confucian Buddhists in China and Confucian Christians. The next intervention is what I call polyritualism, or um, to coin a, a, a quasi-Greek term, polythusia. So we need a concept of polyreligiosity with regards to religious practice or polythusia. In some ways, um, um, is what I think of as polylingualism. So religious plurality is not about the mixing of separate religions, but about the layering of ideas and skills from different religious traditions that coexist in our consciousness as well as in our actions. An analogy is polylingualism. One switches from language to language as one sees fit, code switching, and one usually doesn't mix them in usage but sometimes I do when I speak my, to my mother. I speak Chinese and English together, but I don't do that here. There's always a primacy of the mother tongue, but one can always acquire new languages or religious practices without losing one's first language or fluency, fluency in one's mother tongue. The younger generation globally today are increasingly polylingual, and evidence suggests that there may be polythusia as well, making offerings, prayers, and sacrifices <coughs> to the divine in different traditions. What we see in China is not that far from what we see in contemporary US, or in fact in ancient Rome. Um, and I think lots of um, 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 historians who work on the Roman Empire can tell us a similar story. So now let's um, quickly go to some of the ritual theories offered when it comes to ancestral rites in China. This is from Brescia's 2011 book, Ancestral Memory in Early China. Um, she, uh, uh, this book looks at um, uh, really um, um, ancient Chinese um, uh, ancestral texts. Alongside the hundreds of definitions of religion in modern scholarship, there are almost as many explanations for ritual. And she wants to um, for use the, the concept of a performance ritual because it's, it's promising in terms of usefulness like any ritual to a kind of interactive theater that highlights ritual's experiential side, its framing techniques, and the seemingly complete microcosmo it endeavors to offer. And um, um, other ritual theorists have been speaking of, um, um, let's move, the importance to move from sincerity to the doing of ritual. So this is from a book by Slingerman, uh, Weller, Pewitt, and Simon called Ritual and Its Consequences. Um, the Christianist phenomenological, s s um, forgive me, the Christian is doing something very different from her Jewish mm -hmm. and Muslim counterparts, maybe a typo. She's engaged in voluntary, discursive, indicative, and very private act. She's sincere. The Jew and Muslim instead undertake a performative, repetitive, subjunctive, some, some, sometimes anti-discursive, and social act even when done alone. They're doing ritual. To conflict all of these acts as prayer misses the point of the different actions and, 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 and the significance for the people involved. Mm -hmm. So 
I disagree with the part on prayer. I think prayer can have many different modes as well. But I want to emphasize this distinction they're making between um, Jewish Muslim rituals from the, from the Protestant Christian ones, and I think the Chinese rituals certainly fall into the Jewish and Muslim um, category. So just very simply, um, rituals include religious rituals and social rituals. And I define religious rituals as prayers and prayerful action. And I'm following some um, scholars of Roman religion here. So let's look at ritual rationality, how people make sense of rituals in China. So in this 2016 survey, we asked the question, are there ghosts in the world? And actually, majority of people say no. Less than 20% of people say yes. Not great difference between men and women there. What do you think happens to people after they die? Nothing left. They become memory. They become ghosts. Um, there's no so. So this is a multiple choice question. But you can see um, very few people actually think they become ghosts um, or, become, um, or um, can help their offsprings. So majority of the people say more than uh, about half, nothing's left to become memories. And yet, they continue doing ancestral rites up to five times a year. So what is going on here? Here I propose something called ritual rationality as opposed to objective or scientific empirical rationality. So ritual rationality, as seen in religious life, I'm just looking at the column on the right, says that belief does not necessarily come, come from facts. Ritual facts are not necessarily empirically proven. It is rational to engage in ritual activities without empirically proven facts. And ritual knowledge and ritual power is about ritual relationships. So here are some of the empirical facts. Very few people in China today believe in the existence of ghosts and spirits as a propositional belief, as a scientific belief. They nevertheless conduct rituals several times a year for the spirits of deceased family members. They would send spirit money or winter clothes or any other objects they wish um, to, to send to the spirits of deceased family members to be used by them in their afterlife. So this is what's happening. Here, ritual action does not necessarily come from propositional beliefs. Ritual facts are not necessarily empirically proven. And there is rational sense-making in the engagement of ritual activities. So the theory of sense-making in organizational theory is actually quite useful here. And ritual action is not about being consistent about belief, but about maintaining and nurturing a trustful or loving relationship with spirits or gods regardless of their scientifically proven existence. So um, here are some of the theorists I like, Paul Van, um, who um, asks, did the Greeks believe in their myth? Um, did the Greeks believe in their mythology? The answer is difficult, for belief means so many things. How is it possible to have belief or believe in contradictory things? It is necessary to re recognize that instead of speaking of beliefs, one must actually speak of truth. And these truths are themselves products of the imagination. There was a time when poets and historians invented royal dynasties off of a peace. They were not forgers, nor were they acting in bad faith. They were simply following what was, at the time, the normal way of arriving at the truth. Um, Diana Ack here um, has been speaking of the polytheistic <coughs> imagination for us to understand um, uh, the divine in the Indian context. And um, Professor Levinson here has also been talking about um, how in um, Judaism what we see is performance of duty as love. Um, so at the core of the so-called instrumental help relationship stands the duties of the two parties, uh, manifested principally in the material assistance they provide to each other. So the answer is that these sources held a concept of love that was more outward, action-oriented, and practical than the one that has come to dominate modern Western culture. So it is in the doing, in the performance duty of love that you live a religious life. So now let me go to women and Confucian ancestral rights. 
And I'm going to skip some of the literature review I did about gender and the sociology of religion and feminist philosophy of religion um, from Pamela Sue Anderson to Amy Hollywood and also discussions of ancestral rights in previous scholarship from James Watson to uh, Zoni and Yan Yun Xiang and Charlotte Yokes. <laughs> and go to the survey data um, I was sharing with you mm -hmm. earlier. Uh, in 2007, we had 67.6% .6 of the people who prayed on their ancestors' graves and conducted ancestral rites in the past year. And in 2016, the number is about, is around 78. So it has been increasing. And there's very little gender difference in this practice of ancestral rights, contrary to tradition. So traditionally, Confucian ancestral rights, um, such as ancestral um, worship conducted at home on altars or by the graveside, tend to be conducted by men only. But now we have um, actually men and women participating equally. If you look at um, um, the specifics, we have actually um, only slightly more men than women who conduct rites by the graves of deceased family members. And again, not much difference in the composition of ritual act activities between men and women, especially when it comes to ancestral rites. And now I'm going to end with two examples from my fieldwork. I have so many to choose from. Um, I'm going to tell you maybe two stories. So this story is of um, actually a professor, um, university professor here in the States. This woman, let's call her Professor Lee. She has given me permission to, um, to use um, these interviews and images. Mm -hmm. So she um, teaches in the States, and she's now returning to China to conduct ancestral rites on her deceased father's grave with her family members. And this is the family genealogy of her Li family, very well printed. Um, it was done recently. Um, the genealogy is very important for many Chinese families. And here you can see the annotated um, 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 notes denoting divorces, um, second marriages, and women are, so women are listed especially, um, especially um, daughters. So in traditional genealogy, um, husbands and wives are listed, but very often daughters are not listed, only sons. But here we have daughters, all children listed. And this is a preparation um, for the ancestral rites, and the grave is in the, in the ancestral village outside of Taiyuan, Shanxi province. So that's spirit money, and that's, that's a picture of the god of the underworld, the, chi the, the Chinese uh, god of underworld um, on that, on that um, bill. It's called the Heavenly Bank, Tiantang Yinghang. And they were um, also writing um, 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 labels for the for the flowers they will be presenting. So they are um, they are Heng um, Fu uh, and Wan Lian for the for the flowers flower arrangements. So um, her one of her brothers is a bank director. So he took us to the village for this um, for this um, ritual, and that is a stele. Um, with a story of the father's life carved on the stele or the gray stone. And his wife is mentioned as well as all of his children, uh, both male and female children. Again, um, a change from traditional practice. And I'm going to show you the way they conduct this so by sending, by burning the spirit money, it will be taken to the underworld. And now they are talking to the father's spirit. So this is a very educated family. Um, if you ask them, 
does the Father Spirit actually exist in the underworld, they will probably so say no as it as a empirical question. So she's offering um, an account of her life to her father. So this is kind of official um, 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 grave offering with no uh, no uh, connection to ancestral rights. But this is in Shanghai. Um, this is a couple actually who are Christians, Protestants. And on the day of Qingming, uh, which is a Chinese um, uh, festival uh, venerating the spirits of deceased family members, they went to the, um, the, cem uh, the, um, the cemetery about an hour outside of Shanghai, still in the suburbs of Shanghai, where they did rituals um, on the grave of, um, of um, the husband's deceived parents. This is an enormous um, um, cemetery. I just want to show you, you may not be able to see it. It says at 8 o'clock, there are about 2,000 cars in the parking lot and 13,000 people. By 11 o'clock, there are 7,800 cars in a parking lot and about 57,000 people. And this is one of several major cemeteries um, 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 in the Shanghai suburbs. So these two Christians um, do not um, do any of the offerings that you saw on the graveside um, earlier um, because they don't believe in making um, 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 that kind of offering, but they did bring flowers. But right next to the grave they were at, we have elaborate setup of offering of incense, candles, and food and flowers. And imagine 50,000 of people doing this in one cemetery. So I think I want us to take a step back and say, why does this matter? It matters because this is 80% of the Chinese people conducting a ritual that most of us have very little knowledge about. And instead of being, um, um, being um, 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 puzzled by its meaning, I think, in fact, our task as scholars is to find ways of making sense of it. So I think if we follow the kind of um, theoretical framework I was suggesting earlier, we may be able to ask questions about not just religion, but also gender and ritual comparatively. So if we follow the idea of composite religious identities, we can ask, is there a gender difference when it comes to composite religious identities? If we think about polyritualism or polythusia, we can look at, is there a gender difference when it comes to multiple ritual practice? If we look at ritual rationality, again, we can look at gender difference um, 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 in the practice, in the sense-making of rituals. So I just want to give you a, a, some of the preliminary um, um, findings I have based on looking um, at <coughs> some of the interviews about gendered afterlife and gendered ritual power. So the issues of lineage is an important one in genealogy, who are listed in lineage charts of genealogies, who are in charge of the changes. And when it comes to marriage and divorces, who determines marital relation of deceased family members, and the issue of co-burial after divorces, which is a very interesting issue, uh, constantly being negotiated. And are offerings made to both men and women in afterlife, and is there any difference in offerings made to them? And in fact, I do not see any difference in offerings made to men and women in afterlife. So 
I think my preliminary um, um, finding about gendered afterlife is that men and women are being treated more or less the same in Confucian rituals when their, gender, when their afterlife is envisioned. Again, that is um, a, a big transformation from traditional practice. And if we look at gendered ritual power, we can look at who are the lead celebrants, who are in charge of food and other items for grave and altar offerings. We can look at who are financing the tomb, tomb building, cleaning maintenance, and other ancestral rights related expenses. We can look at who are in charge of ritual liturgy, if there's any, and who are in charge of the organization of ritual activities. I think in order to understand Chinese ritual life and to make sense of it, we need to rethink our very category of religion, our very category of rationality, and also the very category of modernity. We cannot say this is um, something that's uh, passed down from the past being, being transmitted and reflexively. In fact, people have very reflective accounts about what they're doing, and I have um, 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 a lot of love to share with you in Q&A as well. This is Shanghai today, and I have been looking at ancestral rights and other ritual practices being conducted in one of the greatest cost, uh, metropolis of um, human history. I think we need to think about live religion in comparative perspective, both ancient and modern. We need to think about death and afterlife. Um, through our understanding of the ancient world, in order to shed light on the life's experiences and um, narratives of a meaningful life of people today, especially women like this, um, wonderful people in the, uh, in, the, in the sisterhood of traveling prayers. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know some people may have to leave for two o'clock classes, but um, so if you have to go, we understand, but we're going to um, continue for a half hour of discussion if you're willing to take questions. And we do ask because we're on videotape that you speak into a microphone if you have a question. Do we have a runner? Um, um, I can Evidently not. Okay. Uh, let's see if I, anybody want to volunteer? Thank you. Would so, you have a question? Okay. Okay. Um, let me. Pass this down. I think there's no way I can, I just have to hold it. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Didn't know that my voice is so powerful. Tux. Better? Well, still pretty. Um, okay. Um, Thank you so much, Professor Sun. It's a very touching, very informative uh, lecture, and I was especially moved by the video. I think most of our audience are non-Chinese native speakers, but the professor, the, um, the lady in that video, she was talking to her ancestor, her father, I believe, said that, I come across, like, cr across the sea and come back to see you, and all my family are good, and my husband is good as well. It just like, a daily talk through, uh, through form, through, <laughs> but it's really touching. I was whipping. And um, also I want to just, uh, I, I think that um, our audience may not just, uh, the, the Qingming festival you mentioned and the, our ancestor worship you mentioned is actually, uh, I think this is important information, is forbidden uh, decades ago, uh, as, uh, viewed as a super, superstition by the uh, communist party and was reviving just in the latest uh, few decades and the, the Qingming festival became a public holiday 
I believe it's just a one decade. In, it's just a, in 2008. Yes. And the question I want to uh, raise is that, that um, the gender equality that you mentioned in the modern uh, ancestor worship practice, I'm a little bit suspicious about this because uh, the, the cases are all from, like the, I don't know, like the data, are they all from Shanghai or, yeah. And Shanghai is like the, the most developed area in China. I doubt if you do the same, the very same survey in Shandong province, where I know that, uh, well, well, from my personal experience, uh, like from my friends from Shandong, like only males are, can participate in the ancestor worship. And I'm not clear about like if uh, the female ancestor could uh, receive the offering, but I just want to, um, um, like, have you have you noticed the, the huge regional differences in China, modern world, or even urban world? I mean, absolutely. Yes, indeed. Um, however, if you look at the survey data, uh, there actually isn't. You don't see a great difference in the survey data, and the survey covers uh, both rural and urban areas. It's a national representative survey, so that's a nationally representative survey. So, um, 56 different sites in China covering cities, towns, and villages. But your point, your point is a very important one. So the change is happening in stages. So as you said, ancestral rights were not allowed during the Cultural Revolution, it came back slowly. I think the revival really happened in the last 20 years. And on Qingming, um, since everyone goes back to one's ancestral hometown to do ancestral rights on the, on the, on the graves, the, the government actually had to make it an international holiday in order to do traffic control. Um, so um, so that, was, that started in 28. Um, The one-child policy has played a role in women's participation in ancestral rights. So more traditional, um, especially in the North, more traditional um, um, families or rural families tend to emphasize the all-male quality of ancestral rights, uh, all-male char character. But women are increasingly um, accepted. Um, there is a regional difference, but I think the trend is that more and more women are allowed to do it, um, sometimes without a great, um, without really creating much of a conflict. Let's say there's only one daughter in the family, um, then who is going to do the rights? The daughter has to do it. In fact, I've done interviews where people say, well, I only have one daughter, so I have to teach her how to do it, so she can do it for me when I'm, when I'm gone. Um, so there's a very pragmatic um, solution to, to, that, um, to that issue. Just follow up on that question of what the um, experience of women starting to perform this formerly male ritual means for them, um, as well as how that came about. What's interesting about ancestral rights on the graves, especially, is that because it went underground during the Cultural Revolution, it never stopped. It went underground, and people in urban areas um, tend to do it much less in, in rural areas during those years. There is a kind of um, loss of ritual memory. So a lot of these rituals are being reinvented. Um, with reinvention of rituals, two things, I think, become apparent. The first is that there isn't really a ritual authority um, the managers of those um, ritual object shops become authorities. They teach you how to do the rituals. Um, a neighbor, um, someone um, in, the, in the cemetery at the next grave, you watch how other people do it. So with a lack of ritual authority, then I think women have more room to participate since it's such a fluid process of creating and recreating rituals, reinventing rituals. And also, with the loss of ritual memory um, and the reinvention of rituals, there's less ritual anxiety. So people are not so worried about getting things wrong, 
but they worry about not doing it. And I think ritual anxiety is stronger in places like Taiwan and Hong Kong, where there hasn't been a loss of ritual memory. So there are, there are, there are stronger constraints over what people can do. Um, but I see very little ritual anxiety in urban China. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. I really love the way you put together qualitative and quantitative analysis uh, and the very, very methodic way you move from, you know, one section to the other. My basic question has to do with the way you describe a ghost at the beginning of your lecture. Uh, do we regard ghosts as restless spirits of deceased, could be children or parents? What is the Chinese term for ghost? And do they make a distinction between that and spirits uh, uh, and death that are considered to be good? Uh, in the African sense, if you do not die well, you cannot become an ancestor in most cases. So is that distinction clear? The second question has to do with your theory of rituals. I'm going to think seriously about it. But it seems to me that uh, making a distinction between um, what you call a ritual rationality and ritual within the context of religion may be problematic a little bit. Can that be seen as a, almost the same uh, Cartesian distinction that is made between rationality and non-rational, or science and, you know, maybe religion. Uh, for the people who participate in it, do they make that kind of distinction? Uh, this is, I'm still thinking about it, but maybe you can sort of help me out. Uh, thank you, those are great comments. So yes, there is a distinction between um, a good death and a bad death. Uh, someone who has a bad death uh, will have to have ritual professionals to do certain rituals to um, to chow do to to um, to um, sort of cleanse the 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 the, the problematic um, death. So a ghost, a hun, who is being offered ritual is an ancestor. So remember there's a picture of people burning spirit money at street corner. So I interviewed people who do that ritual, and some of them would take a few pieces of the spirit money and put it on the side for the wandering ghosts to pick up. It is charity. It is also an attempt so the, that the, un, the, the, un, the, hun, the wandering ghosts, the hungry wandering ghosts who have no offerings being made to them will not interfere with the ancestral spirits picking up the spirit money that belong to them. So such distinction absolutely exists. Um, how they make sense of this? They think the question of whether there is a, um, um, a, a, a corresponding um, reality um, about um, spirit money in, in the underworld, ridiculous. So I would ask them, um, so on winter solstice, you would burn paper money so your ancestors can have money to purchase winter clothes. So that's the name of the festival, Han Yi Jie. So that's a festival, the date when you send money so they can purchase winter clothes. Where do they buy winter clothes? Are there supermarkets? <laughs> do they get cold in the underworld? Are there seasons in the underworld? And they would say those questions are irrelevant. It is not about whether there's a corresponding reality. Well, they don't use those words. But they say it is, it is because we have the need to do this for them to express our loving relationship with the deceased family members. It is getting cold here in Beijing or in Shanghai, and that's when we do this um, um, for, our, um, for our ancestral spirits. If you say it's purely symbolic, 
then they, that doesn't quite work either because there is a kind of reality in the way people make sense of the steps of the rituals. So there is something real there that can be reduced just to a symbolic understanding. So they refuse that distinction. Um, in fact, I interviewed one person who said, um, of course, you know, there isn't a super, there isn't a place to use money in the underworld. After, uh, otherwise, look at all the paper money being offered. There must be great um, currency inflation in the underworld. <laughs> and this is a very rational person, and he pushes my rational question to the extreme and to show how ridiculous it is. He says, that's not the point. Thank you. So that was a beautiful talk. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for going first. <laughs> um, I wanted to say that I really loved what you said about in the performance of love, we live the religious life. I think that's such a beautiful formulation. It's beautiful language, it's a beautiful phrase. Um, and, but it also got me thinking on a more sort of, not negative, but the other, the flip side of that is, um, Sometimes, right, ritual performance isn't about love. So this particular type of ritual performance that you're looking at, can it, can it also be the manifestation of other affectivities, guilt, fear, anger, revenge? I mean, I don't, I don't know anything about this topic, so I'm just purely asking. Um, and if so, how does that intersect with the questions you're asking about gender, right? So um, I was just curious, you know, um, I, I love that idea that it's love that motivates the ritual, but what if it's not? Does it ever not? And what shape might that take? Mm -hmm. That's such a great question. Um, this is a ritual that's about love, but also about regret, about potentially a bad death, because we don't know how the fetus um, um, died. So it could be an abortion, it could be illness. I don't know that story. So this could be one of the rituals you're speaking of. Um, I think the process of sense making is still there. And in those moments when one feels um, fear or guilt, people reach into their um, ritual toolkit or, or rely on their ritual habitus to do certain things you wouldn't do in a different context. So in many ways, the, existing, the existence of rituals like this allows you to express um, your emotions, um, complex emotions, in a form that exists outside of you. Um, you don't have to do it by yourself. In fact, you're helped by eight Taoist priests. It's not a personal relationship. It is a ritual relationship. Um, I think it's, it's very, I, I, I need to think about the gender dimension of this. Um, um, but I think um, it's important to think of ritual situations where it's not a performance of of love, it's not um, of a kind of, um, it's speaking of the kind of the affect of rituals, it's, it's, it could be a negative one. So thank you for that point. Uh, just, uh, just a quick follow up on the uh, earlier question about the role or the nature of ghosts Spirits. It's my understanding in uh, ancient China, uh, the recently dead were actually perceived to be somewhat problematic and had to be propitiated by a lot of ceremony. And that over, the t over, the t over time, which means time in terms of generations, one, two, three generations, they became placated, maybe to the fact that they were dead, I don't know, accepting of it, and they became positive in their role in the family. And I wondered if any of that notion still existed in attitudes that people have toward, toward the dead and the responsibilities that they bear toward them. Uh, sorry, I didn't catch the first, your very first sentence. Did you say priest? Oh, okay. 
Um, Yes, um, it varies greatly <laughs> uh, regionally what you do with it. Yes, um, um, that notion is certainly still there. Um, I've observed um, a funeral recently um, in, um, in, in southern China. Um, there was a three-day um, vigil with uh, quite, a, quite a bit of ritual performed but actually not by ritual professionals, but only by family members. Um, so, but there are places where you actually do invite a, a Buddhist um, or Taoist priest or priests to conduct those rituals. So I think funeral rites is, a, is of a rather special category and it can be far more complex than the kind of ancestral rites people do annually. But that's a great point. So, uh, thank you for a really wonderful talk, Professor Sun. Um, I'm interested in how you're conceptualizing ritual, in part because you're using mostly, almost exclusively, Western ritual theories. Uh, but China has a rather rich theory of ritual of its own, uh, Li, which um, f transcends religion. Um, so it's not, uh, whereas Western ritual theories tend to only talk about religious rituals, um, and sometimes we extend that a little bit to the political realm or something like that. Um, in, in Li is, is any conventional behavior whatsoever. Um, and so I wonder how that, it, whether you find that that could be a useful analytic category in your work and how that colors uh, might color uh, what you're seeing in terms of ritual, particularly in terms of the folks who are going to different types of temples and don't really care as much about the distinctions. Mm -hmm. um, part of that has to do with the fact that ritual and prayer is actually fairly continuous among them in terms of the formal process of it. Mm -hmm. uh, burning incense and bowing and, and writing prayers on the cards and hanging them up. Um, and so, and so how those things color how we might think about ritual in China is very, is very different in, in that respect from what we see here in the West. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Larry. So Li um, is a great concept. Um, I think Li covers what I call both social and religious rituals. So there's Li between teacher and student, uh, father and child, and there's also Li for the deceased family members or with, with, with gods. Um, I am focusing in my work on Li that's religious um, or dealing with um, something that's outside of this world. So the Chinese word I actually use um, is Ji and Gong and Bai. So those terms actually cover the kind of prayers and, 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 and offerings I've been speaking of especially ji and bai. But you're right, Li covers those terms, and um, I've been um, uh, looking at um, uh, this um, um, text, Zhu Zi Jia Li, um, almost a thousand year old text now, and that one um, speaks a lot about the religious aspect, but also, but also the social aspect. So there's, 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 there are weddings, there are funerals, but there are also the kind of buy you do for something outside of this world. Um, and you're right that people in China, when they do rituals across religious traditions, they do the same ji and buy. Um, so uh, what's interesting about the Chinese religious ecology is that people have the same religious habitus across different traditions. So we do the same ritual in the Taoist temple and the Buddhist temple. So unlike us, when we go to a Christian church and, and we go into a mosque, we have to do different things. In Chinese ritual sites, across traditions, you do very similar things across board. There are differences, but 
but um, the similarities are striking. So it's the same ji and bai as ritual action. My question, my question was actually quite similar to the previous one because I was I was curious about, um, right? It was because sex secular rituals exist, right? And I was thinking particularly with um, Confucianism because we talk about you know the three native, well, religions of China and you have Fu Jiao, right? Is 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 more obviously a body of teaching that has a religious import. Um, um, Dao Jiao, you, you know, you could also argue, but but Confuci Confucianism is a sort of neologism, right? It doesn't really exist in the Chinese tradition, right? It's, it's the teachings of the Ru, um, and and the, the idea of this Latinization of a of a body of teaching becoming a kind of state religion is something that's you know it is politicized, and I'm just wondering if 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 um, you really trace a distinction because you're saying, and it's very true, right, there's this hodgepodge kind of um, worshipping at the Temple of Confucius. Um, but, I mean, is, is, is there sort of differences in the way that people conceive of um, Confucian rites as opposed to Buddhist beliefs? Or, and, again, and again, it's a question of semantics and a question of you know, what words we use, whether we're using xinyang, zongjiao, right, or, or, or other kind of folk practices. Um, and I think it's, it would be interesting to see the phrasing of these surveys, right? Because obviously if you phrase them in a certain way using certain vocabulary, you would get different responses. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just curious also about your first book because I, I, I really struggle with this question of is Confucianism a religion? So I'd, I'd love for you to speak a little bit more about that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for the question. So... Um, I was trying to find the, the sorry, I can't find that the, the survey data. Um, very few people I've interviewed call themselves Confucians. If they do, they tend to be philosophy professors in China. Um, and answer to rights are universal if you, if you think about it in a very thin uh, form. The thin version of ancestral rights can be found in Africa, in, in, in North America, South America, etc., South Asia. I call ancestral rights being performed in China for the most part as in Confucian mode because the actual practice, the language being used, and the ethical expression are in the language of Confucian teaching. Azir, Buddhist Confucian rites, sorry, I misspoke, Buddhist <laughs> ancestral rites, yes, in fact. Um, um, and sometimes people do both Buddhist and Confucian ones at once. So it needs to be argued, I think, for, from as scholars, we need to argue that what we see in China What's performed on grave sites, like the video I showed you, is Confucian. And also, I've in fact, in fact also been asking people, do you think this is Confucian? And most people say it is. Um, so, you will have to do two things in order to ask that question and answer that question. The first is to define what you mean by religion. So, yeah, yeah. Um, all um, so so you have to have your so according to what definition of religion, and secondly is actually um, a political question, which is that if it is not religion, what is it? So, I think. In the post-colonial world we're in, we have been questioning the definition of religion um, um, that has been part of the knowledge process um, of Protestantization. But that does it mean we need to, we should give up on the notion of religion and say they do something separate, different? I actually think that to call ancestralized religion opens up the conversation rather than closes it, because we can speak of rituals, similar rituals in ancient Greece, 
um, in contemporary um, Africa, in contemporary India. We can go beyond um, whether this is Hinduism or Confucianism, but to say this is a religious ritual and what it means. In other words, I'm bypassing the very definition of this is a religion, but to speak of religious ecolo ecology, how different religious um, um, practices can, can coexist. And I'm speaking also of religious action without attributing that to a specific fixed religious identity. In other words, I'm going for religious, but not a religion per se. No, sure. I, I think it's. I think that's that's a, an interesting way of thinking about it. Because I, I was living in um, China last year and participated. Uh, well, I, I didn't participate, but I, I happened to be there at um, some teaming pra uh, practices in Shanxi Province, um, and it was a Taiwanese family. And it was it was again, like the gentleman was saying, extremely moving. Um, to see this Taiwanese family, and they'd fled the mainland um, in 1949, and they were coming back to their ancestral um, plot to, you know, to sweep the tombs, to to lay offerings, and this kind of thing. And their ancestor um, had been quite a important figure in in, in the 1911 re uh, revolution, and he had his own sort of ancestral temple. And I'd never seen anything like this before, and it, I thought it was utterly fascinating because when you walk in, um, there was a portrait, like an oil portrait of this man, you know, this general, above an altar, um, as, uh, in the same sort of religious iconography, you know, mm -hmm. of a Virgin Mary or something. Um, and, I, and I sort of was chat chatting to the husband of, 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 the, ancest of the ancestor's granddaughter um, and saying, oh, it's so strange, you know, to me that, that you, um, you know, that you, I think I said something like, worship your ancestors like a god. And, and he was like, no, 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 We're, like, it's not about worshipping, it's not about, this is, just, this is just a demonstration of respect. Um, and to me, it, that's more of a secular concept. So, uh, but, but, but it's in a very religious framework, but maybe that's just because I'm looking at it through Western eyes and seeing, you know, what I think of as an altar. Um, so I, I just think it's such a fascinating realm of overlapping and trying to tease it out. <laughs> Thank you for your reflections. Thank you for your well, reflections. You've clearly stirred up a lot of conversation here. Is there any yeah. final word you'd like to make to the group? That we uh, we are out of time for questions, so I'll give you the last word. I'd love to hear more from you. <laughs> um, I'd love to hear more from you. You know, also thinking about the last comments, um, which are really wonderful. What? are we doing when we say something is religious and something isn't religious? So I think as scholars, as scholars of religion, um, if we want to break free from the Protestantization framework, um, it's not enough just to offer critiques, but also we have to offer constructive categories in order for us to move forward. The goal is to do justice to the very complex lived religious experience we see globally. And my own attempt is to come up with a few conceptual frameworks that will allow me to really do justice to what I see rather than reducing it to someone I, something I already know. And my hope is that these categories may be helpful in thinking comparatively across the globe, also across time. Thank you so much. That's